This video calls for a slightly stricter dress code. That's better. We match. Now that I'm dressed appropriately, let's talk about James Bond Nightfire, an FPS game based on one of Britain's most notable IPs, and according to one guy on the internet, the best Bond game. Being published in 2002 by EA, it was riddled with DRM, which actually makes it unplayable on modern versions of Windows, and it's largely Microsoft's fault. But before we get into that, let's just try and get a copy of the game. As is becoming increasingly common with these videos, I've ordered a copy off of eBay, but whilst we wait for that to arrive, let's just head to the Abandonware sites. The game isn't for sale anymore, so it's important to preserve and make sure people can continue to play it. There does exist a fan site for this game, which contains patches. However, the site doesn't use TLS, and the last update was in 2017, and I think the patches are all closed source? However, they do have a Discord, so I'll link all this below if you want to check it out. It's probably a good place to start if you want to get set up quickly. For now, I'm going to throw this random ISO I found on the internet into a VM and hope it's not malware. Uh, hello, darkness, my old friend. A CD key is required. So we've seen this before. This is actually another program the installer launches to check for a key, presumably as some sort of abstraction so EA can ship different CD key checkers with the same installer. It's in a folder called EA Support and called James Bond Nightfire underscore code.exe. Now there's several solutions to this, ranging from easy to hard. We could just grep the internet for a key, or hope that when our copy arrives from eBay, it has one. We could replace the CD key checker program with one that always returns success. We could patch out the installer so it thinks the check always passes. Or we could reverse engineer the key gen algorithm so we can generate our own keys. Guess which one we're going to do? So let's slap this into Ghidra, an open source disassembler and decompiler, and start poking around in its guts. The first thing I like to do is search for the string in the error message. The theory being is that it should lead us close to the code that does the verification check. I'm hoping for something along the lines of, if code is valid, return success, else show message box. The string is in there twice, which is strange. Looks like it's passed to some localization function. Maybe it's registering different translations of the same string as they look similar. Nailed it. Searching for the string isn't bearing much fruit, so let's look at message box A, which is almost certainly the Win32 function used to create the error pop-up. It's called from three places, so let's just fire up a debugger and find which one it is. We can set a breakpoint on this function and then just enter an invalid key. Okay, so this is the function that creates the message box, and that's called from here. So if param6 is equal to oxc, then display the error message. There's quite a lot of code here, but before we dive into figuring it out, there's one more avenue we can pursue. So far, we've been going bottom up from the message box, but we can always try going top down from the code that reads the text boxes. I suspect get Windows text A is the function used to read the input from the text boxes, so let's set a breakpoint on that. It's called from here, however, it seems to get called three times for every keystroke, which is strange. It's eventually called from DDX text, which is a macro used in the MFC library to manage data exchange between controls in a dialog box like text fields and associated variables in your program. Well, that clears things up. I found a bunch of these calls here, and this gets called once per keystroke and looks like it's synchronizing the input fields to member variables. So now we know the memory address the characters are read into, we can set a hardware breakpoint on it so the debugger will stop when the code reads from it, which presumably it will have to do at some point if it wants to validate it. So we've stopped in this misery. Let's set a breakpoint on this function and rerun it to see what its arguments are. It gets called with a bunch of strings and possibly some sort of ID. No wait, I'm being stupid. That's not the ID. It looks suspiciously like the string length. Tracing things through, it looks like it all comes down to this call here. If the result of this function is non-zero, then the program exits normally else it displays the error message, and we can verify this by using the debugger to change the return value. The arguments are ox43, ox59, and the fully concatenated key. I have no idea what those two numbers mean. 
Looking into this function, the first thing it does is some sort of early exit check based on some class member. It always seems to pass, so I don't really care about what it actually does. Not sure exactly what the first function call does, but looking at the result, it appears to slice off the last part of the key. The next function looks complex. It takes the first three parts of the key and the two mysterious numbers and runs it through this hot mess. At the end it produces a number, ox1565. Sure. The next function gets us the last part of the key, and we pass it into another function which gives us a new number, ox115c. Finally, it checks if these two numbers are equal and both non-zero. If that's the case, then we return success. So it computes some sort of hash or checksum on both parts of the key and checks if they're equal. So the game now is to reverse engineer either one of these algorithms to try and force it to match. The function that works on the last four digits of the key seems simplest, so let's start there. It initially does some loop and calculation based on some global data, but I can't see how it influences the final result, so I'm just going to skip over that. It then does some checks based on if the input has ASCII plus or minus characters, which it doesn't, so ignoring. The final loop is interesting as it actually calculates the final result. It loops through each character in the final text input and does some lookup into a global array, which looks like random values with mostly alternating zeros. I think this is some sort of obfuscated length check, as there's no way this loop can exit unless the lookup returns zero, and presumably it will loop through each character. The actual meat of this function is this line here, which subtracts ox30 from each character, adds it to a result, and multiplies it by 10. Wait a second. Subtracting ox30 is just how you convert an ASCII number character into its actual numerical value? So all this code is doing is converting the string we put in the last box to a number, and I can see the result is just hex 4444. Surely it can't be that simple. Do I just need to enter the value of the first computation into the final box? I am invincible! There's 5,477 reasons why I shouldn't give out the last part of this key, but I'm sure you understand. Let's continue the install. After a brief argument I had with the VM over the second CD, it's installed. Ah, good. I can register my software to be eligible for technical support. And it doesn't run, as expected. Now let's repeat this whole song and dance with a Windows 10 VM, and the reason why will make sense in a minute. Okay, closer. Please insert the correct CD-ROM. So the game can run, it's just failing some check, and this is what I expected. Now let's talk about the DRM inside of Nightfire. According to PC Gaming Wiki, it uses SafeDisk, and if we use the SafeDisk version checker tool from Yartes, we can see that it's version 2.80.10. At a high level, the way SafeDisk works is that it embeds a digital signature into the key when it is manufactured, and this is done in such a way that most copying software will fail to replicate it. I'm not super sure of the exact details of how this works, but it doesn't really matter for this. The key takeaway is that if you copy the disk, you are unlikely to also be able to copy the digital signature. Now when the game runs, it verifies the presence of this signature, and presumably it needs quite low level access to do that, because it does it all via a Windows driver. When has that not ever ended well? In fact, the driver itself was indeed vulnerable to exploitation, so Windows withdrew support for it from Windows 10 onwards. Whilst it is arguably the correct decision to remove a vulnerable driver, not providing a workaround means there's hundreds of games that can no longer work on modern versions of Windows, and I find that quite egregious. So that's where we are with Nightfire. It won't be able to use the driver it needs in order to verify that I own a copy of the CD. Speaking of which, my CD should be arriving right about... It's uncanny. What am I doing in my life? Okay, let's get a bit more comfortable. Okay, let's slap this in. And it works in Windows 7. I trust a CD from eBay more than an ISO from an abandoned website, so I'm just going to install this on my host machine to make things a bit easier to debug. Now my initial thinking is just to RE the game and patch out the calls to the driver, however I've noticed something in Procmon that's making me doubt this approach. 
These temporary files are used by EA's launch code where the logic is packed in several different DLLs and wrapped in layers and layers of obfuscation. It also means the game and launcher will be riddled with anti-debugging techniques. In short, if you've seen my video on Sims 2, you know this will be painful. So let's take a different approach. When I was searching around for details on the version of SafeDisk, I stumbled across this repo, SafeDisk Shim. According to the README, it intercepts communication requests from the game to the driver and returns the expected result. This is quite an elegant solution, basically emulating the driver in userland. So I've stopped looking at the repo here as I want to try and implement this myself because I think there's quite a lot to learn here. First things first, we need to try and exert some control over the game. Normally I'd patch the first few instructions to jump to a code cave where we can load a library and return. However, that's quite brittle and I fancy mixing it up. Instead, we create a simple launcher program which uses create process, but pass it create suspended so the process will start in a suspended state, i.e. paused at the start of its execution. Now the process is suspended, we can inject another thread into it using the aptly named create remote thread. Out of all the arguments, we care about these two, the address of the function to call and the data to pass to it. Now both of these addresses need to be in the running game as that's where the new thread is going to spawn and run from. But ultimately our goal is to get that thread to execute code that we control. So for the function, we can pass it load library, which is the win32 function for loading a library. There's a nice curio of windows in that this function is at the same address in all processes, so it's easy to get the location of. We just pass it the location of in our launcher. This function takes one argument, the path to the DLL to load, which we can supply via create remote thread. But again, this needs to be the address of a string in the game itself, but by using virtual alloc x and write process memory, we can allocate some new memory in the game process and copy our DLL path to it. So after all this song and dance, we can coerce the game to start a new thread running code that we control. When you create a DLL on Windows, you write a DLL main function, which Windows will automatically call for you on load library. So let's bring this all together. Our launcher will inject the payload into the game and the payload will write a simple log file. Beautiful. Of course, Windows Defender gets grumpy with me at this and I'm not sure why, it's just normal code. Okay, so now that we're in the game, let's start rewiring things. Windows has this concept called the Import Address Table, or IAT, and this is just a large array of function pointers, each one corresponding to the address of a function imported from a library, and these all get filled in when the library is loaded. So we can overwrite these IAT entries, so when the game thinks it's calling a function, it will actually call our code instead, and if we save off the original entry, we can then forward that call to the original if needed. Effectively, we can proxy any library call we want, inspect the arguments, potentially forward onto the original, and change the return value. So to start interacting with a driver, you first need to get a file handled to it via create file A. So let's hook that and add some logging. Okay, we can see that being called for the driver. Next, to actually interact with the driver, you use device IO control, but hooking and logging that, it's never called? Okay, I see the problem. We need create file A to return success, which it's currently not doing when we forward it to the original function, presumably because we're not supposed to be using that driver anymore. Using our hooked function, we can check if the file being opened is the driver, and if it is, return success and a fake file handle. Now we can see device IO control being called with the fake file handle we returned. Device IO control has some important arguments we need to go over. It takes an in buffer and size, which is the data you supply to the driver. It also has a counterpart out buffer and size, which is where the driver can return data to you. There's also DWIO control code, which is an ID specifying which operation you want the driver to perform. From looking at all the logged calls, it seems the safe disk driver only offers one command code, ox ef002407. But there's a lot of these calls. Let's do a bit of analysis on these calls before we dive any further. Every single input buffer starts with the same 12 bytes, so this could be some kind of header. After that, there's what looks like a number, which could be a further ID. And if that's the case, there's only six unique IDs, most of which are OX3F and OX41. The output buffer always starts with a different fixed 12 bytes, again, possibly a header. Assuming the same call order between runs, it looks like the output buffer is the same, except for these five bytes, which changes each time. So we can't simply record and replay. Let's just break the driver open in Ghidra. So I don't do a lot of Windows kernel stuff, and I've clicked around fruitlessly for a bit and nothing has jumped out at me. However, let's try my usual Ghidra search trick. We can dump 
all the disassembly for the whole binary into a single file and then search that for constants, offsets, or things we hope exist. I just want to clarify, this is not the real driver code, just an approximation as C, so it definitely won't be perfect. The only thread we have to pull on is what we think might be the driver command, so let's just search for aux3c. And here we find a switch statement with all the IDs we've seen, plus a few more. As well as that we can see that the value being switched on is oxc bytes into the buffer, the same index we observed in the logs. I'm feeling pretty confident right about now. The call site for this function does a check against the magic control code we saw as well. Also, this function uses probe for read and probe for write to verify user land buffers, so from that we can infer the variables used for input and output buffers. The function for handling aux3c just sets some values in a buffer, which is pretty simple. Then it sets the magic header we saw. And finally it calls this function, which mixes some magic numbers in with the kernel tick count and sets it at the part of the output buffer we saw changing on each call. I guess this is some sort of checksum which the user land app is expected to verify. We can recreate everything we've seen here in our payload DLL quite easily, but the timing based checksum is a little bit trickier. The value represents how much time has elapsed since the machine booted and it's just readily available for drivers, which run in the kernel, but how do we get it in user land? Fear not, for Windows has you covered. There's a special struct called Qser Shared Data, which contains lots of interesting things, including the tick count. Now Windows maps this data into the same address in all running processes. So if we write some absolutely terrifying code which dereferences this random address in memory, in theory we'll get the kernel tick count in user land. So now that we have access to this, I've just re-implemented the algorithm that I found in Ghidra. Let's just log our output buffer guess. I'm a little bit shocked, but it's actually the same. So let's take this one step further and try returning that to the program, therefore bypassing the driver entirely. Nice. Now we're cooking. I've implemented the other commands, and most of them are just setting simple values. Ox43 has some extra logic where I need to fail the command if certain conditions are met. For example, this number needs to be less than 8, and definitely not 4. Sure. I want you to be under no illusion here, I have no idea what these commands do, I've just blindly re-implemented them. Before doing that, I did do a quick sanity check against the open source shim I found, and it looks like we had the same approach. We both rebuilt the kernel tick checksum and set the same random results in the output buffer. I would say that if you want to use this in anger, you should probably use this code, as it's way more fleshed out than mine. They've handled more commands and reverse engineered more of it than I. For example, they've said that the headers for the input and output buffers are version numbers, and they've even given names to some of the input commands. Okay, moment of truth. Yes! Yes! I am invincible! Okay, quick caveat. None of the cinematics seem to work, but I don't think I actually care. Let's play the game for a bit to check things actually work. Alright, watching this guy do a sweet parallel park. Ah. And pew 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 pew! Oh, I guess he's just gonna read the paper as I mow down his mate. Nice. What a whirlwind tour of defeating a keygen and DRM. I'll make sure the code is available on GitHub, and I'll link it down below, along with all the other resources I've mentioned, along with my own Discord. However, if you want more low-level shenanigans, then you'll want to see how I crushed a 3D FPS game into a tiny image, here. <laughs>